It was during the hot, hot summer of 2004 that there came a group from the Netherlands for the very first time to Kosovo. And that group was volunteering for an NGO that helps uh, uh, families who lost their father during the war. One day, the, uh, the group was visiting a house in a small village. And there was a just newly built house. The family didn't have like a house for, for five years. They had like, in the time in, in between, they had a kind of weird building to live in. But finally, they had their own house. And the mother of the family of six kids invited the Dutch group to come upstairs and to watch um, the, the panorama view, the mountains, the mosque, uh, uh, the rooftops. So the Dutch team, they came upstairs and one of them, a 20-year-old student, he looked out of the window and indeed it was beautiful. So he took his, his camera and in that time we didn't have like, um, like phones with cameras and stuff. He had like an old fashioned camera. So he took a picture and it was indeed beautiful. He turned around and he saw two girls behind him of 11 and 13 years old from that family wearing the exact same red t-shirt. It was very cute for him and um, they were smiling with a very big smile. So the 20 year old foreigner decided like that is so funny I'm gonna take a picture of that as well and remember in that time you couldn't take like 2,000 pictures. You only had like 34 pictures or whatever and then you had to buy something new to make another 34 pictures. So it was very special for these girls. Why? A couple of days later, that group was visiting that house again. And the girls of 11 and 13 years old with the red funny shirts, they were not forgotten, uh, they had not forgotten about the Dutch students and they made him a drawing. And that was very cute. And a couple of days later, the Dutch group visited again, and again, these girls made a drawing for him, and that went on and on, and sometimes it was like a, a written letter in English, in pretty crappy English, and, um, and it went on and on, and there was some kind of friendship between the 20-year-old and the, and the two young sisters of that family. So, that's like end of story, and I'm curious, who thinks that that young guy from the Netherlands uh, met these two young girls later on as well? Can I see hands? Some of you, well, I have good news for you. Yes, they met. That guy, he liked the country a lot, so he came back the year later, visited the same family, and he came years and years and years and years later until he decided that he liked Kosovo that much, that he emigrated together with his wife to Kosovo. Um, I know that story pretty well because that guy, that's me, and um, it's now 2017, and I'm living here for five years with my wife and in the meantime we have three little kids and um, in the 13 years that I'm attached with Kosovo I met hundreds of foreigners visiting like NGO workers, journalists, tourists, business, uh, business people and somehow they are always kind of amazed about Kosovo and I'm not surprised about that. I think that Kosovo is not just another Balkan state, not just a uh, uh, a satellite state of the, of the United States or a former province of Serbia, I think there is something unique in Kosovo. If Kosovo would be a dish that you have to prepare, it would be very difficult to find the ingredients for it because the ingredients are pretty rare, especially in the West. And three of those main ingredients I would like to, to highlight today. And uh, uh, those three aspects, um, they are for the people here in the room that are from Kosovo, not new. You know your own culture, but you might not be aware that these aspects might be or are very relevant and special for foreigners from the West. Okay, let's go to the first one, religious tolerance. That is something that seems to decline every day in this world. I don't need to give examples. Um, we see it every day on the news, what can lead from it. And um, as you know, most Kosovars consider themselves Muslim, but for the law of Kosovo, their faith, their religion is just as equal as Catholicism, Christian Orthodoxism, uh, the Jewish faith, although there are just 100 Jews here in the country, and the Protestants. And that is interesting. But that, that's, of course, the law. So that doesn't, say, that doesn't give the whole picture. Um, if you're here in wintertime, especially around Christmas, 
in Pristina, the capital, then you will see the center decorated fully with Christmas decorations. And there are one or two enormous uh, uh, Christmas trees and people are making selfies with it. And um, not only here in the capital, but also in a more conservative town of Prizren, you, you see the same in the center, a, a Christmas tree and, and a wish for, let's say, happy Christmas. And many people from Kosovo, they have a Christmas tree in their own house as well. Although you guys call it a New Year tree, probably. Um, do you know that this country has more national holidays dedicated to Christian feasts than to Muslim feasts? Three to two. And that um, it is very special that in between the mosques in Pristina and the, and, and the big Catholic cathedral is the Mother Teresa Boulevard dedicated to the most famous non-Catholic nun of the world whose parents were from Kosovo. And that along that boulevard, there is a Holocaust memorial. And to me, that, that is Kosovo. So that was the first aspect, religious tolerance. And the second reason why Kosovo is so unique to me, I think that's the, the pro-Western attitude. Um, many streets, we, we already talked about like one uh, boulevard, but many other boulevards are, are named after US presidents. And that's not only because Kosovo is, is very thankful to, to the role of the, of, of the Americans liberating their country during the 99 conflict, but it's, it's way more. Kosovo might be even the 51st state of America. Uh, there's a big military base here, there's a very costly embassy in construction, and there are several NGOs um, developing economy and uh, democracy here in the country. And to understand Kosovo and also this role of the pro-Western attitude, you need to understand the diaspora. So 28% of the Kosovars do not live in the Republic of Kosovo, but they live outside. And you find all these, all these people, all these Kosovars outside, playing for national football teams, for example, tonight for Switzerland, becoming singers in London, being IT specialists and experts, and so on and so on. And during the summer, they all come back to the motherland or fatherland, and they do not only spend their US dollars, their European money, but they also bring back um, uh, the Western values. And between Kosovo and the West, be, be, because of that large diaspora, millions of phone calls, Skype messages, Facebook chats, uh, Viber messages are going on and forward between the diaspora and the Kosovars within Kosovo. And to imagine how special that, that is, that pro-Western attitude, just look to some of our neighbors. Many, in, in, many inhabitants of those neighbors are anti-EU, anti-NATO, anti-America, and here it's like the opposite. So, it's not something that is normal. Um, I think that if Kosovo would be a house with only one, uh, one window, that window would look over the squares in Vienna, um, Berlin, the people in London, and if you put on your glasses, you, you, you probably see the skyline of New York City. So that's, I think, Kosovo. That's the second ingredient of, of that dish named Kosovo and why it is such a unique place. And the third one of them is the hospitality, the famous hospitality here in Kosovo. The first years after my immigration in 2012, I lived and worked in Jakova. Are there other people here from Jakova? Yeah, some, yeah. Well, I could, you know, have two or three TED Talks about Jakova and the beauty and whatever, but maybe next year when they will invite me again, or don't after what I've said right now. Um, in that time when I was living there, I did not own a car, so I landed from a colleague of mine. And for example, when I had to go from Jakova to Pristina, um, I went by car and I came back at 10, at 11 p.m. So in the evening, and then I parked that car at the parking lot of his apartment, and I had to walk like four or five levels in his apartment and knock on the door to give back his keys. And although it was late night, he always said, Haida, Haida, for coffee, come for coffee. <laughs> and you have to laugh because you know that this is the culture here. And it didn't matter to him that he is married with a wife, has six kids, one daughter-in-law and two grandkids living in the same apartment, which was smaller than the apartment that I was living with my wife in that time without kids. So these principles of, of hospitality, they go back to the, the traditional law of the Albanians, the so-called kanun. And um, one of the pillars of that kanun 
is the hospitality. Several paragraphs are written how to treat your guests, your visitors, etc. And still you can, you can see that, that, that mindset in 2017, you can still see that and feel it. If you read the journals of, of tourists and backpackers and, and travel bloggers, you, you see that they are always surprised about how the local people are treating them. Last year, um, my parents, they were visiting us um, by car and their GPS broke down so they could drive to Pristina, but they didn't know where, where we lived and their phone didn't work yet in, in Kosovo. So they parked their car in the middle of town, imagine, and went out and asked someone who walked by, like, please, can you help us? Can you call the, the number of, of our son? So that young man, he, he did it. So at home, I suddenly received a call from an unknown person who said, there are two people here, are these your parents? No, I said, no, 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 I don't know them. I said, no, yes, of course. And he said, can you please come and then pick them up? So I went and he waited for 10 minutes together with, with my parents. So when I arrived at that spot, um, my father wanted to thank this Kosovo guy and gave him a couple of euros. And when I saw that, I had to laugh out loud because I know that that would be ridiculous to think, like if you're helping foreign visitors just by, by doing a phone call and waiting with them, that you received the, the, the money for it. And indeed, he did not accept it and went on. So that is symbolic for the hospitality to me as well. And it's not only for tourists or family or, 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 or travel bloggers, but also for business visitors, the people that are so very important for Kosovo at this moment. Business travelers, um, in an official survey of last year, they tell, they tell about a very high degree of service orientation in this country. And I believe that I'm not surprised by that. Um, they really experienced that. So after these three ingredients, the conclusion to me is like, this world right now, the world is changing very fast. And there's a new Cold War between America and Russia, which is affecting the Balkans as well. Um, there is more religious hatred among people um, today in the world. And we see that even with uh, uh, ending in, in terrorist attacks. And um, there's a continuing uh, globalization around the world, which makes uh, Western companies more and more looking for trustworthy companies in the world to outsource their work. And where are they looking for? Well, I think that's why the West is in desperate need for a country with a different taste. And this country that produces more international pop stars per capita than any other place in the world, this country is called the Republic of Kosovo. Thank you very much.